So thank you all for attending the, um, this debate. For those who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Hobart. I'm a neurologist down in Plymouth. So the, the process for this evening will be, first, we will vote on the, uh, on the motion. Secondly, I will invite David to speak for, then Gavin to speak against. They've each got 15 minutes, and they'll get a, um, a prompt with three minutes to go. After that, there'll be a brutal question and answer session, which you guys will lead. Then they will sum up, first against, then for, and then finally we will vote. So the motion, which is as here, the proposed new NHS England MS prescribing guidelines will stop the current wide variation in DMT prescribing across England. So this, this debate is not plucked out of thin air. It has been a long time in gestation. Um, and I believe that the process was started with Malcolm Quayley from NHS England Pharmacy and, um, and Adrian Williams, who was the chair of the National Neurology Advisory Group, who proposed to the, um, the SIG that, uh, that we needed to reduce variation by doing three things. By producing some guidance that was consistent with NICE guidance, that we had a platform for prescribing, which is the online blue tech system, and that we introduced a multidisciplinary team process to guide prescribing decisions. So on that note, I will ask David to take the floor and, um, and propose the motion. Should we start with... I always um, forget the vote. Should, I always should we forget start with the a vote? vote. <laughs> should we start with a vote? So, who's in favour? <laughs> You're not allowed to vote. Right. One. Hands going up and down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that an eighth? Yeah. They're coming up and down. Start again. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I'll leave that up to you. And remember, it's the swing that's important. Ten, four, and against. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Has everybody voted who thinks they should vote? <laughs> it's 22 voters. It's less people than there are in the room. I have the deciding vote, by the way, if it's a tie. OK, David, you have 15 uh, well, minutes. Well, well, thank you very much, Jeremy. I, my name's David. I'm a consultant neurologist from, uh, from Sheffield. Um, these are my standard disclosures. Uh, I do have a further disclosure, which is... Uh, over the weekend, uh, it became clear that Gavin and I <laughs> were both preparing the same side of the debate, which we, we, which we felt wouldn't make for a particularly uh, entertaining evening, although we both win. Um, but, but, but Gavin very magnanimously uh, immediately offered to change sides, for which I'm very grateful for. Um, but remember, you're not voting for the nicest person. <laughs> you're not voting for the nicest person. Uh, and I'll show you how these guidelines will change practice. Gavin's very hard to debate against. He's very clever. Um, every time I do this slide, this number goes up and up. Uh, and he does this for a living. He, um, he, he's <laughs> you, can't, you can't go to a major meeting about neurology without seeing him demolish some poor, unsuspecting uh, professor of neurology from, uh, from Europe. Uh, and he's incredibly engaged with, uh, with multiple sclerosis. Uh, he set up the blog. Um, and despite all this, he still has time to email his friends uh, in the MS Academy, although at, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and expect an immediate response. Um, and, and I think of him uh, so, somewhat like a modern-day Achilles, um, <laughs> fighting, um, fighting his, our own battle, um, leading us forth. Um, in a battle against the, the, the two evils of um, ignorance um, and complacency. 
Um, but Achilles had a heel, and I'm going to exploit Gavin's heel uh, t tonight in my debate. Um, and it's when you're so clever and when you live and breathe MS, you can forget quite how difficult this is for us mere mortals, um, for the neurologist who is just getting there <laughs> in terms of his, uh, his, his clinical skills. Um, and it's just getting there with his level of engagement, it, but isn't, uh, isn't quite there yet, has got, uh, has got other things on his mind. Uh, but still wants to offer really, really good evidence-based care to their patients. Let's talk about the evidence. So um, let's look at the papers that we need to know um, to keep up to date with developments in multiple sclerosis. For a long time, we had glutamoracetate and beta interferon, and about 40 papers were published a year. Then came along natalizumab, an extra 100 papers you had to know about. Fingolimod came along, uh, dimethylfumate, alimtizumab, cladribin, and the cumulative effect has been a year-on-year -year increase in the amount of evidence about disease-modifying therapies and multiple sclerosis. The last year, you've had to read 340 papers just to keep up to date with what had happened that year, not, 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 not withstanding the cumulative knowledge that had stood before then. Uh, and let's talk about the rules. So in 2002, uh, the initial treatments for multiple sclerosis were, uh, uh, were, were available. Uh, they were assessed by NICE. Uh, NICE said no. Then the risk-sharing scheme came up. The risk-sharing scheme said yes. Uh, then the risk-sharing scheme seemed to show that people were getting more uh, disabled uh, on treatments. Uh, oh, dear. Then what's looked at again, it seemed to be OK, few. Um, then there's NHS clinical commissioning <laughs> policy, which somehow supersedes NICE, um, saying that people could have MSs according to uh, the uh, risk-sharing scheme criteria but also brought in this small print that I'm not sure everyone knows about, that you could use these in clinically isolated syndrome, only a re single relapse in the preceding two years with MRI disease activity, all within the small print of this paper. Then let's look at natalizumab. It, uh, as everyone's aware, it, it was banned before it was even available and then unbanned. It seemed to work really well, um, but it was too expensive to give to everybody. Uh, so NICE invented a new disease rapidly evolving severe MS, two relapses within a year, uh, MRI disease activity. Um, Fingolimod was only available for highly active multiple sclerosis. That was defined as people with relapses on beta interferon. Glutamoracetate works about as well as beta interferon. Would NICE consider that? Um, this all says uh, no. <laughs> uh, but NHS then looked at it and said yes. Uh, and then dimethyl fumates come along. NICE said no. Then it said yes. Uh, teriflunamides come along, again NICE said yes but with, with caveats. Um, Alentizumab's come along, uh, NICE liked this a lot, said uh, yes, yes, yes in your marketing authorisation. You have to look at another paper to find the marketing authorisation. It's indicated with patients with active disease defined by clinical imaging features. It tells you about sections 4.4 and 5.1 to help you further. Uh, this is what's in 4.4 and 5.1. <laughs> Quite a lot to go through. It doesn't really help you with that, uh, that, that question. And then Diclizumab came along. It was allowed, but you had to be careful. And then it was disallowed because of the appearance of autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, and finally, most recently, Cladribin, which is allowed by NICE. Um, but they've changed the definition of rapidly evolving severe MS. Now, um, you, you have to have gadolinium-enhancing lesions rather than new lesions. Um, and they've changed the definition of highly active MS. You have to have new lesions as well as clinical relapses. Um, so things are incredibly complicated uh, and we really have a mess of very, very complex regulations uh, and a lot of evidence that's really hard for us uh, as clinicians to interpret. Lots of things in medicine are complicated, so does this really matter? Well, it does matter because these are a huge expenditure to the NHS. The NHS spends a quarter of a billion uh, pounds on disease-modifying therapies every year and that's enough to build 15 brand new schools. It's enough to employ uh, 5,000 physiotherapists. You could have 150 therapists, physiotherapists per MS centre. Uh, I'm not sure what you do with them, but, uh, but you could have them for the money. Um, and disease-modifying therapies possibly still are being under-prescribed. Uh, so the MS, MS Society report suggests that only just over half of people who would be potentially eligible are taking one. Things have improved, but even over the last year, uh, one in five people who potentially is eligible for a disease-modifying therapy isn't being prescribed one. Uh, and this is the crux of the matter. It's the, the, the regional disparities in disease-modifying therapies. Um, so if we look at the trusts that spend the most on disease-modifying therapies, overall things are fairly similar, although there are changes, particularly with uh, relative proportions of alimtizumab to natalizumab. 
you look at the middling trusts and you can see that the picture is very, very, very different. That, um, that, that, that trusts vary very, very, very uh, considerably in the disease modifying therapies. Some places not using beta interferon, some places not using alamtuzumab. And you look at the smallest trust, the smallest uh, disease modifying therapies, and they're typically only prescribing one drug. They're typically only prescribing one drug. So I think the existing guidelines are really, really complicated. And we've lived them, uh, well, many of you have lived with them for a long period of time, but coming in from the outside, they're incredibly complex and contradictory. The amount of evidence that we have to decide on disease modifying therapies is overwhelming. What do we do when we can't decide? We've got too much information. We stick to what we know. And I think that's what's happening, particularly in the smaller centres. People are sticking to what they know, what's worked before. What we really need is a team of MS All-Stars to look at all of this, look at all the rules, look at all the guidelines, and synthesise it to us for a, a, a guidelines that will fit on two sides of A4. Um, the MS All-Stars exist. They, they prefer to be called the MS Advisory Committee. Um, and these are the members of the advisory committee. These are very clever people. They've written about 900 papers in multiple sclerosis. If you read a single paper a day, it would take you two and a half years to read all their papers, um, and then they'd have written some more. Um, and what they've done, just like Harry Beck did with the tube map, is turn something that's incredibly complex into this, something that's easy to navigate that we can all um, uh, use very effectively. And these are them. These are the, uh, the, these are the D DMD algorithms. Um, and it's two, it's two pages. So this page with the flow diagram, this page with the attached notes. Nothing more uh, and nothing uh, less. And it tells you. It tells you what to do if someone has your typical relapsing mitting multiple sclerosis with two relapses in the last two years. It tells you what to do about rapidly evolving severe MS. But importantly, it digs through the small print of uh, NHS clinical guidance, uh, through the NICE guidance, to tell you what to do with things that are difficult to know what to do with. Clinically isolated syndrome with multiple MRI lesions, clinically isolated syndrome and MRI activity, uh, and relapsing written multiple sclerosis with one relapse in the last two years. The only way that you could get that information before was through delving through some very complex guidance. It tells you what to do first line. It tells you what to do first line if people can't tolerate the treatment. It tells you what to do when there's disease activity on your first line treatment. It tells you what to do for rescue therapy. And it shows you all the rules for the first time in a clear and transparent process that you and your patients can understand. It shows you all the rules and it will inform Blue Tech. Um, it tells all regions to make all disease-modifying therapies available to people within that region. There's no excuse for not, 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 not having alamtuzumab available. And it tells you what you need for your service for the first time. You need an MS specialist consultant neurologist, an MS specialist nurse, but you also need access to a specialist MS centre and its multidisciplinary team. Um, and all drugs will, will now have to be going through Blue Tech. This is a, a screenshot of Blue Tech. MDT meetings are mandated for those cases that you feel are complex or where you're using higher risk disease modifying therapies. And in your MS meeting, you need, a, in your MDT, you need a colleague, uh, a specialist MS nurse, uh, and access to, uh, to, to neuroradiology. MDT meetings do have a long history in the NHS and are largely res regarded as being very successful. Uh, they were set up in 2000 to uh, address cancer inequalities of care. They've been now been proven to improve survival for endometrium ovarian cancers. Uh, and the interesting thing with MDTs is they get better with time. And not only do they inform individual patient decisions, they have a collective effect um, on the culture within the institution. Uh, and this is some of the evidence for them. Why is all this going to change the practice of the individual neurologist? Well, when people are uncertain about decisions, when they can't decide what to do, Psychology shows that they look for two factors. There's the principle of obedience to authority, where you look to those who are in authority, uh, who you respect, uh, and you have got an algorithm now created by 10 of the finest minds with multiple sclerosis for you to follow. There's also the principle of social proof, where you're not sure what to do, you do what other people around you are doing. Uh, and the MDT enables this. It gives you social proof, it shows you what your colleagues are doing, it helps you feel confident in your decision based upon that. 
Um, so I do feel for these reasons that these guidelines will change people's practice. It will make neurologists more comfortable in prescribing the whole gamut of disease-modifying therapies. It levels the playing field. New neurologist patients all have the very same information. They don't have to remember all these historical changes. Um, but that's not all. So um, just because you know the rule of rules of football, uh, it doesn't make you an Aldo. Um, and it is very important, as well as all of this, to get further, further trained in multiple sclerosis, and that's where the MS Academy comes in. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Now I have to respond to that. <clears throat> so I was going to debate yes, as you heard, so I've got to do the no argument. And I don't think the... I should call it the Troika. The Troika is blue tech the MDT and the guidelines are going to get rid of variation. And the variation is actually quite wide. I think there's a conspiracy going on, because when I went online to download the MS Society document on the variation of prescribing across England, it's gone. The MS Trust one's gone, and the one from NICE is gone. All three documents have gone off the web. So I think NHS England have decided to try and bury uh, the research shows massive variation across England in terms of prescribing. But that's just um, the cynic in me. <clears throat> so this is actually the only thing I could find, but hidden in there is massive prescribing differences. So I remember from memory, Northern Ireland had the highest penetration of DMT, 64%, I think it was. And when we came down to the southeast of England, the London area, it was about 56. And in the north of England, was in the 40s, and in some areas, it was in the 30s. So there was a large variation. And that's just in access to disease-modifying therapies not necessarily access to second line or more effective therapies. So there is an issue, and that's exactly why uh, we were tasked at the ABN to put these guidelines, is to try and get rid of this. Now, that's the question you've got to ask, is will guidelines, because that's the, that's the motion, will guidelines, as they're coming out now, and under, get rid of this variation? <clears throat> uh, and I'll try and address that. So I think the elephant in the room is resource. And so this is looking at the number of neurologists per 100,000 okay, uh, across Europe, essentially. And you can see where the UK is. The UK is down here. Do you see this? And all the other countries are way above us. So I think the issue in MSology in terms of variation has got nothing to do with guidelines. It's got to do with enough MSologists <clears throat> across the uh, country to actually see patients with MS, make decisions, and prescribe therapies appropriately. Um, we've got them all green-lighted by NICE. It's not a case of not accessing these treatments. They've been shown to be cost-effective. It's a case of putting bums on seats and getting neurologists to see patients and make decisions. It's not about guidance. It's about resource. So I think the elephant in the room, actually, if the NHS wants to get rid of variation, they've got to take the UK and stick it up, up there somewhere. But that's, that's a personal opinion. And this is looking at the uh, access to treatments for patients. And you can see this is actually a scary figure because the UK's economy is the second biggest in Europe. We always flip-flop between France and the UK, Germany number one. So we really should be up at the top of the league tables, but we're actually second from bottom, uh, just above Poland. And then we stick out like a sore. That's a sore thumb if there ever was a sore thumb. <clears throat> and so the question is, is that guidelines going to sort this out? You know, I'm being honest with you. Do you think uh, NHS England guidelines is going to shoot us up the league tables because now we've got a piece of paper, a document to read? So that's another question. I think it's all about resource. And so this is what triggered... <clears throat> it's the same data, but it's done in a different way. And I think this is an important data set because this actually look at, looks at not only the proportion of patients that are eligible, but also looks at the number of people that are on second line or more effective therapies. And the orange bar is second line. So this would be... The black bar is just DMTs, and you can see this is the bottom of the league tables. But when you look at the top, you can see countries, and we managed to get data from Australia, is that they have a, a high penetration of second-line therapies. And I actually think the real metric really is not only the proportion of patients that are on disease-modifying treatments, but it's the proportion of patients that are on more effective therapies. <clears throat> and I think if we need to define that proportion, uh, and people in Australia are telling me, and based on the data, that probably at least 50%, probably 60% of your patients should be on a second-line therapy if you're treating MS properly. I see Martin Daddy shaking his head there. Would you agree about the figure, 60%? Not at all. 
Yeah. What? That was a nod. It's a nod. Would you, would you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So Australians would say 60, and, uh, and, and I'm aware that if you go to places like uh, Sweden, um, it's probably closer to 75% of people with MS in Sweden are on a second or third line high efficacy drug. Uh, and so the question is, where would you want to be managed in a country where you have access to more effective therapies? I'm not talking about treatment strategies in terms of flipping the pyramid. It's about getting people to the treatment they need. And we are way down below <clears throat> uh, where we should be. Is that not guidelines going to sort that out? That's the question. Are, are these three, uh, is the troika going to sort this out? <clears throat> And so this is the guideline. It looks very simple, but actually it's very difficult to navigate. So even, though, even those of us who are acutely aware of what is active MS, what's highly active MS, what's rapidly evolving severe MS, what's second, third line types of therapy, we find this, uh, there are lots of little idiosyncrasies in this thing to interpret. So I think when it goes out to the general <laughs> neurologist or the MSologist who doesn't spend most of their time doing MS, they're going to find this very confusing. So why measure? So if you can't measure, you can't improve it. This is the philosophy that goes behind it. And this is what Bluetech is designed to uh, sort out. Now, who's used Bluetech? We all used it. Do you think Bluetech's going to sort it out, John? Okay. Well, anyway, so this is a country, Sweden, which I admire. I've been all over the world talking about MS. And the two countries I would want to be managed in, if I had MS, is either Australia, probably Australia first choice, I think second choice, I'd like to go see a Swedish neurologist because of their access to treatments. So in Sweden, <clears throat> where they have the highest penetration of DMTs in the world, the highest penetration of more effective DMTs, and they actually use an off-label drug called rituximab in more than half of their patients. And in some parts of the country, in the north, for example, 100% of MS patients in an MS center in the north of the country are on rituximab. If you go to places like... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the Karolinska, about 55% are on rituximab. But this is just looking at the variation across Sweden in terms of access to therapies, from 94% down to 36%. And they've had guidelines, they've had guidelines in their country since 2007. So in a country like Sweden, that is well <coughs> monitored, well resourced, they have guidelines, they have a database where 98.4% of MS patients in Sweden on a database they can't even sort out variation of access to treatment. And they've got wide variation. <clears throat> so my personal opinion is when you look at an analogy like Sweden, where they've got all these things in place that we are going to be put, have in place, do they do MDTs in Sweden? I'd be surprised if a Swedish neurologist will allow another one to tell him what or her to do. I suspect they don't have MDTs. But they have the other two uh, components, the database uh, and the guidelines, and they has not sorted out variation. Okay, in Sweden. So keep that in mind as an example. <clears throat> so I gave a talk at the Cleveland Clinic a few months ago, and after the talk, one of the uh, uh, neurologists in the audience, uh, Andrew Goodman, get, sent, sent me an email and said, Gavin, you've got to read this book. It's called The Tyranny of Metrics. And so it's about when you measure a system, you change the behavior of a system. It's like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As soon as you measure something, you change it. <clears throat> this is me preparing for REF 2021, you see. So you change the way you behave when you're asked to measure something. And actually, this book's worth reading because they talk about the NHS. So who remembers in 1990 the Bristol cardiothoracic surgery scandal? What was the... You remember that? Bolson was the anaesthetist who blew the whistle. Is that right? And he's now working in Australia. But out of that came the, uh, the legislation that surgeons have to declare... <clears throat> or monitor their outcomes. So when the first outcome measure came, which was mortality, the f number one cardiothoracic surgeon on the list who had the highest death rate was a guy called Sir Mag Magdib uh, Yacoub. Do you remember Magdib Yacoub? And he had about a 40% mortality rate. And so, my God, he's got to be the worst cardiothoracic surgeon in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, so he was the only surgeon that would operate on half the list. So he was the uh, surgeon that would do the unoperables. So the point about metrics is you've got to be very careful <clears throat> how you interpret them because people game them. And what surgeons have been doing is they've been refusing to operate on people <clears throat> okay, to keep them off their mortality list. Okay, and they would discharge them back to referring hospitals to keep them off their mortality or readmission list. And they game the system to look good on the, on the thing. So this is what happens with metrics. I wouldn't trust 
any metrics. Uh, and we're thinking about doing that in our center. So this is actually part of the guidelines is stopping criteria. And so you may be aware of these stopping criteria. They're not really evidence-based. They're a little bit of a thumb suck. So obviously, if you've got no response, <clears throat> if you can't tolerate the drug, and if you go into a wheelchair, okay, and I think that's very, very important. Obviously, if you become secondary progressive. So these two criteria are going to be implemented. And at that meeting that we had Adrian Williams at and Malcolm Qualey, Malcolm Qualey said they are expecting a 10% churn rate. And I said to him, you've got to be joking. We're not going to be stopping DMTs in 10% of our patients because they are hoping that that expenditure is going to plateau with people coming on and people coming off. And I said to him, 10%, one in 10. I said, it's, you're going to be lucky if it's 2% of people that are churning. And so what he was saying is that when people go into a wheelchair, and that's what blue tech's going to do, is when you put seven in that blue tech and you don't stop that <coughs> therapy, you're going to get punished for that. Okay? So what's going to happen is, is we're going to game the system. So we're, going to, we're finding the funds to buy ourselves a, <coughs> a, one of these exoskeletons. And if you look at the EDSS, it's done with disability walking aids. So is this person who's wheelchair bound, who's now made EDSS 6 with an exoskeleton, is this person still eligible for DMTs or not? So that's what's going to happen to our centers. We're going to game the system, and you're going to find that there's going to be this people going from 5 to 6 to 6.5, and they're going to be at 6.5 forever because we as neurologists are going to be very uh, reluctant to take them off DMTs when they hit 7. I predict this almost certainly EDSS 7 is going to vanish from Blue Tech because we feel uncomfortable, and I think we should feel uncomfortable because there's a large amount of data emerging that these therapies work into wheelchair users by protecting upper limb function. Anyway, who, who recognizes the man? Very famous. Now, he won the Nobel Prize in 2002, the first psychologist to win the Nobel Prize for economics. Daniel Kahneman, okay? And so he um, introduced with his partner, Amos Tversky. They were from the uh, Hebrew University <coughs> in Jerusalem. And they brought up uh, this theory of behavioral economics. And they talked about all these things called cognitive biases. If you want to read his book, Fast and Slow Thinking, it's a good read, but it's a turgid read. Eh? What he says in the first 70 pages, he repeats for the next several hundred. But... It's worth reading, but actually a much better book is this. Michael Lewis is a great author, and he wrote this book called The Undoing Project, which is really about Kahneman and Tversky's relationship, and it's one of the best reads I've had in a few years. I read it last summer holidays, and it's a, it's a compulsive read. But you'll read about this, and you begin to realize is that we're no different to anybody else in decision-making, and we have our own cognitive biases. And so some of the cognitive biases are, well, anyway, <clears throat> the theory behind uh, the cognitive biases is that Humans struggle to think statistically. We just can't think in statistics. So we arrive at a binary decision, okay, and this is based on reasonable probabilities, and uh, the theory behind this is called heuristics. And these are the four I just pulled out of the list, anchoring. So this is our tendency to be influenced by irrelevant numbers and all recent experiences. For example, if we had a patient who had natalizumab-related PML in our center, it's unlikely we're going to prescribe natalizumab in the next six months, you know, just because we've had this bad experience. Is that evidence-based? No, it's not. And that happens. It's been shown to happen. Availability, a mental shortcut that occurs when people make judgments about the probability of events based on how easy it is to think of examples or anecdotes. This could be an example of a recent case of autoimmune hepatitis to interferon, for example. It makes you reluctant to prescribe interferon because your, your recent experience affects your, your next experience. Optimism and loss aversion. The pervasive optimistic bias generates illusion of control. Uh, this is what we call the gamble, gambler's dilemma. Nobody goes into a casino to lose money. They're always going into a casino to win money. The optimist. We know from statistics that the average gambler will lose money, but not the individual gambler. <clears throat> and so this is one of the biggest biases I find in, in neurology, in, in MS, is that most of uh, us are pre not prepared to tell our patients they have a... Uh, a poor prognosis, we tend to favor them having a good prognosis and we tend to overplay that diagnosis. And so this will play into uh, our use of DMTs as well. And then framing, framing is the context in which choices are presented. A person with MS is asked whether would opt for, opt, this is an example, would opt for uh, alemtuzumab if the long-term remission rate is greater than 60%. 
while another is told that the secondary autoimmune rate, or elemtuzumab, is 45%. Okay? The first framing would increase acceptance, even though the situations are no different. So it's how you frame the question you can manipulate this. Do you think the guidelines are going to affect these biases across England? <clears throat> and that's the question you need to ask yourself. And we all got these biases. And the problem about these biases, they're not conscious biases. These are unconscious biases, so you're not aware of them. You're not aware of them, and uh, I'm not sure an uh, NHS England guideline is going to get rid of these biases. Two minutes? Okay. Anyway, this is the problem. Okay. The problem is the NHS is under-resourced. Okay. The two few MSologists say we need meat on the skeleton, which is true. The, MS, the NHS is running on a skeleton service. Our bandwidth to change things is minimal. Guidelines are far too complex. <clears throat> Ideally, we need an Australian solution. And the reason why I say Australian solution is because in Australia, the drugs are licensed and neurologists make decisions. Uh, MDTs are not necessarily a solution because there's groupthink, so centers will think like each other. And it's not going to get rid of groupthink. Blue tech is primitive. There's no granularity and it's not quality in, in well. And metrics and behavioral uh, and our cognitive biases will affect things. So the, these biases will, allow, will result in us gaming the system and therefore the inequality won't go away. Okay? And I don't think guideline is enough. We need a political solution. And there's an example in this country. When the stroke needed to be sorted out, the politicians put in legislation that created HESUs, created national guidelines, and stroke management is almost uh, across the country now on a, on, a, on a par. And until we get politicians to legislate and give us the resource, not the guidelines, the resource, we're not going to change things. So I think my personal opinion is another way of changing things slowly is education. But I think uh, uh, um, to make a difference, uh, we need not to accept guidelines. We need to accept NHS resource. So I personally think you should vote no. This is not the solution to inequality in this country. We need politicians to give us money. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
decide what you're going to describe. Remember when you going to say any, any relapse is clinically significant. We put that in, remember these got lifted from yeah. the right. guidelines. So that is so said that any relapse, relapse is clinically any significant. Any it's very flexible. And you, you sign these like a prescription, you sign them with your GMC identification, and these will be all of this. Yeah, but but any relapse is clinically significant. If you record yeah. a relapse, whether it be numbness of the middle finger, yeah. that's a relapse. And actually, Garen Fuller is going to present tomorrow, I, I, I might pronounce it wrong, with GER data. Uh, but that might be something else he's talking to now. But basically, I mean, it, it proves uh, Gary's point about the beginnings of variation. It's startling variation of what prescribing goes on. So, ben, but so what. What Ben is describing is gaming the system. Yeah? He's, ga he's gaming the t treatment criteria. But, but I mean, you know, I had a colleague, someone who came to see me uh, for a second opinion about stem cell therapy, and the colleague said, look, just go on tech for three months, and we'll find something, and you can have stem cell therapy. And then I was thinking, so that, that's what you're up against. Yeah, so I mean, you know I, mean? I, agree, I agree, I agree, and I disagree with. Yes, but I agree and disagree with you. Um, you know, innovation costs money, and we've got to pay for innovation. And so the co cost of drugs eventually plummets after patents come off. So I remember having this debate when I was uh, a registrar in med general medicine in South Africa about could the South African government afford statins. Uh, you know, it was a big debate because South Africa has an enormous ca cardiovascular hypercholesterolemia problem, and there was just this debate: could we afford statins? Some of the statins, <coughs> you know, it was on patent. And look what—I mean, statins now are like uh, 0.6 p a day. And so, what will happen in five to ten years' time? These therapies will become that 250 million will peak at say 300 million, and then it will just go down. And so, I don't think we should focus on the price of drugs. The price of drugs, I think, is not the argument here. It's about treating MS. You know, that's my personal opinion. I don't think, I mean, we, I agree NICE is, uh, NICE is in response to rationing of therapies, but um, all these drugs have patent lives, and there are systems in place to bring the prices down, and they will come down quite quickly. As soon as Fingolimod comes off patent, which is in about two years' time, 40% uh, of that will, uh, I suspect the price will drop by 40%. So I think we shouldn't, my personal opinion is not to focus on price. It's uh, yeah. At the back. <coughs> So, I mean, only so one respond to that. Well, I, I, I agree. Um, and uh, one of the problems is that we just have so many nice guidance. So, every medicine has its own nice guidance. And then some medicines have NHS clinical commissioning policy, which supersedes to a certain extent the guidance. Um, and it's baffling in its complexity. Yeah. And there are little things that we as specialists and neurologists uh, who, who are particularly interested in multiple sclerosis know, like the fact that you are allowed to use beta interferon for clinically isolated syndrome for people who've had a relapse within two years and alimentizumab for those patients. 
which I don't think is widely known amongst all people who prescribe disease-modifying therapies. What the guidelines do is give everyone that information so, the, so they are able, better able to, 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 to follow NICE guidance. But, 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 but Alex, we know, this, is not about, this is not about nice guidance. We actually got nice guidance. It's just not even being implemented. It's basically nice have given us all these therapies and they're not being used. It's about implementation of nice guidance. Yeah. Right. But I think the point is every, every MS centre in the country is, has, is, is aware of the NICE guidelines, can download all the NICE guidelines, can download NHS clinical commissioning policy, but make very different decisions about which disease-modifying therapies they use. Um, and my argument is that it's just too complex, and particularly if you, you're in a small centre, you don't have support, you stick with what you know rather than try new therapies. I, I, I think the guidance will help with that. So we, we know all the little loopholes, most people, but there's still massive variation. I mean, all the algorithm is, is sort of crystallizing that into one place. I, you know, we all, mostly, I mean, you may be right about there'll be maybe some small centers that basically just give people first-time treatment and what have you, but, but there's massive variation within that. And just by crystallizing it to one algorithm, do you, re do you really think that that's actually going to change? Well, well, I do, because if you look at the big centres, they, they, they behave broadly in the same way. They behave broadly in the same way. And there are quirks with the use, uh, particularly of second-line disease-modifying <coughs> therapies. More use nat some, some use more natalizumab, some use more antizumab. Um, and the guidelines aren't going to change that. that and some that, use more HSCT. And some use more <laughs> HSCT. <laughs> um, uh, but, 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 but I think the big centres are big variations. But, but, but if you look at the graph, they're similar. They're, they're, they're broadly similar. But if you look at the middling centres, that's where you get the real alterations in practice. So I think, actually, the, the big centres largely behave in the same way. And that's, that's the basis of my argument, actually, that within, if you're within a big centre where you're interested in multiple sclerosis, where you're talking to one another about what you do, you behave broadly across the brush in the same way. When you're in smaller centres, you're less sure... You, 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 you don't have the same access to MS expertise, you don't have the same access to colleagues, you stick with what you know, and that's where the disparities come in. Sean, sure. last slide. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think this is, this is about nudge. And, you know, certainly at the meetings we've had lots of discussions about networks. Okay, um, the last slide. Yeah, it seems kind of yeah. the, the smallest atom in the molecule of a network that the, the thing of access to an MS centre, and you're just making it apparent. And um, having been at one stage criticised because Sheffield was one of the highest prescribing centres, um, such that we're going to close this down, and then when we made apparent the lack of uh, therapy and our numbers of people with MS, they, we, we got over half a million to pay the backlog of PMTs out of them a few years ago. So actually, making things obvious has a value. And I, I, I think that's undervalued by people. MDTs, we criticise them. They say, oh, they're all very bland. But actually, there is evidence that they work. And um, it does give you the chance for peers to challenge each other. Um, and the other thing is they will look back and see if there's still disparity. Then they will look at why there's disparity. So you will get that much. And yes, I agree, you know, there's the allergies and mark centres and that's an important thing. And you look at someone like Sheffield that used it a lot of... Uh, uh, sort of natalizumab traditionally, and that's because we were the second biggest trial centre for natalizumab when the trial was out, and Cambridge and Bristol use a huge amount of, uh, uh, you know, so there's these historic reasons, aren't there? But you find things are easily out now. Middlesbrough are never going to ever gonna come and bring the prescription. I've decided not to prescribe this patient and bring them to the MDT to ask me to agree with their non prescription. I'm only going to hear about their natalizumabs and their alentuzumabs, and I'm going to agree with those. I don't see how this or the MDT. So there's a case for the Cardiff system where they need to assess everybody. Mm. Uh, and, and I think, I think that has a, has a value that they, they discuss everybody. I would be surprised, and I think NHS would be disappointed if the net result of this was to increase prescribing in the UK. Oh, I hope it will. I hope it will. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Klaus, you had yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a little bit along, I mean, similar lines. I mean, I think what the, the one sort of example is, which is really oblique to sort of the perhaps principal idea to homogenize sort of description and based on evidence about efficacy and safety, um, having that sort of in, is Alaptuzuma, which is kind of sitting in all sort of left, right, and center in the whole uh, algorithm. And when that's true, what you say that the Kind of, that there's largely similar prescribing across the large centers, which is probably not quite true, but perhaps, I mean, uh, uh, there's a tendency to be that the, sort of the, the larger centers have more inclination or more facilities, whatever, to prescribe highly effective drugs. Then where does this lead us in, in, in the sense of where is it going, what, what do you want to homogenize across these centers? Um, so where I think where, where, where you, you end up with the shortage um, that was kind of flagged up of neurologists, the number of prescribing centers, which is 24, and then uh, the access to that is going to be a problem for those who are autistic or in these ages. And uh, so I think in the end, this will be and, and only lead to a more restricted prescribing on the whole. And um, I wonder for what reason, because I mean, if, if, if that's true, there's, I mean, there's a whole number of drugs that are coming sort of off, um, off, off patent in the not so distant future. <coughs> and uh, by all intents and purposes, DMTs don't make the big chunk of, of cost for MS anyway. So I don't quite, I mean, see really the I mean, great point. I don't know whether there was an argument for you or for you. <laughs> <laughs> ben, you were uh, chomping. No, I wasn't chomping. I just, yeah. I just wanted to bring up yeah. one point of order I did feel I had to bring up about David's list of ten great names. There's at least one name. <laughs> 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 it wouldn't have been years. There's a question as well. But I, I think the great thing is about kind of where I think, David, you are right about variation. I think it's um, name and shame in a way. If you can show what's happening, if you see this data, it is, as Gavin alluded, quite stunning the variation across the country of what's going to happen. So hopefully by having guidelines, having data, as Gavin said, to prove what's happening. Real game it. I think by demonstrating <laughs> what's happening. <laughs> Bruno. I think as a small example in real practice, <coughs> effectively smaller centers are coming to the larger centers to ask uh, for an MDT in view in anticipation of this, asking to prescribe uh, drugs that they would otherwise not prescribe. I think that would be a bit of a business. It's already happened. Again, not to sound negative, I've had my chief pharmacist come around to see us to say, why can't you be more like Middlesbrough? <laughs> look, at, look at your wasteful prescribing, look at what a centre with a very similar demographic can do. I want you to become more like them, and we'll look at your blue text and we'll look at you and say you're prescribing. The, the that, that's that's you know, the naivety that believing this is going to and increase. The big disparity is not Middlesbrough and Newcastle, it's this sort of Newcastle and the middle of nowhere. And the, the smaller centres, who normally would be really a middle income country level, going to the larger centres to ask... The Middlesbrough is that level, it's one of the lowest in the country, and yeah. we're in the same region, they're looking, we'd like you to be more like them. When we look at the British, you're an outlier, do this. But why isn't it just going to make Middlesbrough more like you? I mean, that's, that's sort of the thing. That's what it's going to do, because but it makes the choices apparent. I, I think it's also makes wrong. crazy, highly active RES... MRI criteria look as crazy as it is, and I think there's now a real move saying, you look, we've got, you know, four different drugs for which you now have different rules. Um, uh, and you know. there is there is data on how MDTs affect practice, and they do affect practice over the long term. Um, and actually, it's the more charismatic individuals who tend to to to, to drive the change in practice. So, I, I think there's hope for you. For you, Martin, at Middlesbrough. Well, well, as Gavin said, MDTs, it's Newcastle MDT. You know, the yeah. uh, senior guy, I've appointed three people who prescribe like me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think it's worth saying that NHS England have said what they think is going to happen. They've published an impact assessment. They think it's going to say, between the algorithms, it's going to say £4 million on that £250 million by the fourth year of implementation. 
They're expecting a churn rate of 10%. I think they took your 2%. They took us 2%. It's 2% now, because I'm told Malcolm Crowley this, forget it. There's no way we're going to take one in 10 people off therapy. It's impossible. But the official expectation is not that it's going to increase this rather. But it's also not that it's going to massively change the dialogue. And decrease Whether you buy that, but they have officially said <coughs> Sean, you mentioned Nudge, because you know, a, a very famous collaborator of Kahneman and Tursky was a guy called Richard Thaler, and he won the Nobel Prize for Economics last year. And he was actually an um, advisor to, Tony, uh, to um, um, the last conservative government, you know, and he created the Nudge unit, and that got us Brexit. So be careful about nudging anybody <laughs> anywhere, okay? <laughs> so, what? Yeah, no, but it's <laughs> yeah. Klaus, you had a, another question. Yeah, no, it's just um, um, kind of rambling, but, but actually the, the change in practice will rather come in opposition to the guy trying to get anything else. Yeah. And the NDT might sort of actually carry that forward, because these are the units that sort of can, can drive this. And it's and a nobody, treatment algorithm yeah. rather than a guideline. I think mm. that needs to be made clear, you know, because basically it tells you what you're allowed to do rather than what you should do. Any final questions or comments? So, I need you guys to sum up. Gavin first, please. Yeah, so, yeah my personal opinion, the motives underlying this NHS England initiative are flawed. And if they really want to make change, they have to do it with politics. They have to get a political statement from uh, the Department of Health and they have to resource it like they did with stroke. Uh, this is going to change nothing. And we've got analogies. And so uh, I think it's... Uh, unlikely to make a single dent in uh, variation in prescribing across the country. Those are embedded behaviours that are unique to the geography, the region, to groupthink, uh, which I'm glad Martin agrees with me. And I suspect um, it's just a, a facade to try and reduce expenditure. That's what I really think. So I don't think it's been set up to uh, really address the issue. If they want to address the issue, they would know how to do it. They would throw money at it give us more neurologists, give us political statements, and give us uh, hard, you know, the stroke teams have databases to put, data, uh, they have metrics to answer to, there's an, a national audit, it's really, really run very well, the stroke teams. Uh, we need to become like stroke physicians if you want to make a difference. So I think this is going to make no difference at all. Please vote no. David. Um, so so I, I, I disagree. Uh, G Gavin's provided us with a psychological tour de force uh, in, <laughs> in, in, in his presentation. Um, and I, I think sometimes when, when you're at the top of your tree, you forget quite how difficult all this is for the average neurologist working very hard in a small centre. Um, what the algorithm does is shows us what every everyone uh, is allowed to do and makes that crystal clear to you and to your patients. Uh, I think it makes it easier to switch, it makes it easier to know what you to do, it makes some of the small print that's hidden within the guidelines about the use of alentism, about the use of beta interferon easier. And, and the other thing is that it does give you the principle of social proof. You learn what your colleagues are doing. Uh, Bruno's given us a great example of that, his colleagues from around the region are approaching him about, uh, about their MDT and they're changing their practice as a result of that and they're changing their practice to be like Bruno. So I think that the combined weight of a clear algorithm setting out the rules for you, um, that you don't have to dive into loads and loads of difficult documents to understand, is really, really welcome for UK neurology. I think it will help particularly the small centres decide what to do and I think having an MDT is a really powerful way of uh, making you feel more, more empowered in prescribing the second-line treatments. Uh, and I think it will bring places up. I think it will have that impact on treatment. Thank you. OK, guys, thank you. So... <clears throat> it is time to vote. So those in favour of the motion, and remember, you can only vote if you voted first time around. 
So, are those in favour? Eleven. <laughs> and those against? Eight, <laughs> which doesn't add up. So <laughs> somebody, somebody, or somebody. some people have not voted. It looks They've like abstained. It's a, it looks like it's a, um, uh, nobody's made it, we haven't swung it out of the way in a way. Well, you've swung one, four, and four against. Hmm. So, it looks like uh, the motion is supported to a small degree. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So just to say to you, uh, one of the ways we try, just a quick, just for the last few minutes, if you don't mind, is that we launched MS Academy and Sarah is going to uh, come up front. So Sarah started the thing called the Neurology of Parkinson's Disease Academy 15 years ago? Uh, 2002. 2002, so it's 16 years ago. And it became the NIDAS for educating uh, trainees and neurologists around the management of Parkinson's and actually care the elderly around Parkinson's disease. And they created uh, um, a, 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 a Twitter force in the UK in terms of uh, postgraduate training. And we're trying to do the same in MS. This is the MS Academy, which we launched two years ago. And we'd like to thank the sponsors. Biogen have been sponsored up until now, and it's going to be sponsored by a multi-sponsorship in the future. And the idea is to take trainees and uh, general neurologists and specialist nurses and allied professionals and bring them on the course and teach them how we manage MS in special centres, how we manage actively and uh, try and diagnose quickly, try and um, uh, monitor, and how we manage the disease holistically. And so we've had about how many courses now? Uh, we're on five in June. The first one. And the feedback has been incredible. And, but more importantly, we're trying to get all the MS experts uh, in the country on the course in terms of teaching. And so we hope it's going to become a, a nidus for... Um, an MS, like the British Society of MSologists, the MS Academy will become so we can all get, get together and share experiences. And we launched a thing called the MS Forum, which is essentially an online portal where we can actually share business cases, case reports, we can discuss cases in, uh, in, a, in a private portal um, amongst each other uh, to try and share best practice. So I actually think the solution to this problem actually is education rather than anything else. And hopefully if we can train the next generation of neurologists and have enough spare capacity in the system, that we will change the way uh, British uh, neurologists, or well, the British system, the NHS, manages people with MS. Because I think it's unfair to blame any team or region because of uh, inequality. It's uh, a systemic problem across multiple diseases, and this is an NHS issue. And so hopefully initiatives like MS Academy will address that. So there are some uh, little information sheets on the desk. If you've got trainees, please put them forward. And we would like anybody to volunteer to come on to teach on the course. We want as many people engaged with this initiative as possible. And some of the things that have come out of Parkinson's, for example, they developed the, an audit tool. Is that correct? Yeah. The audit tool got incorporated into NICE guidance, for example. So, you know, we can see something like this happening in the MS space. So um, it's about education. <laughs>